should get started. Um, so it is our uh, pleasure today to uh, welcome Dr. Kelly for a presentation, um, who is going to present on risks, uh, mechanisms, and treatment of stroke in patients with chronic kidney disease. Um, and so Dr. Kelly is currently in uh, Dublin, but through the magic of uh, a virtual uh, uh, Grand Rounds, um, we have the chance of uh, hosting her this morning and she didn't have to travel many hours. So uh, uh, something good uh, comes out of bad, I guess. And so uh, Dr. Kelly, our speaker um, <clears throat> is, uh, as I said, is coming us from Ireland. So um, lots and lots of, uh, of publications uh, um, in the last few years, so congratulations. Too many to count and, and, and to enumerate, uh, but um, she does have a bit of a unique connection to Ottawa in the sense that uh, she uh, she's connected to our, our infamous uh, Twitterati Swapnil through uh, the, the uh, NEFJC and the uh, Nephrology Social Media Collective, so uh, she was a fellow and now she's faculty with Swapnil, and also um, uh, she is the, um, uh, Dr. Kelly is uh, currently a renal uh, fellow network co-editor, so congratulations, uh, amongst uh, all the other academic things that she does. So, uh, well, uh, welcome to Ottawa. We're very excited to uh, hear your talk, and uh, I'll let you go ahead and, uh, and present to us. Uh, good morning, Ottawa. Um, lovely to meet you all. Uh, thank you so much for the kind invitation to speak today. Uh, it's particularly an honor for me as I'm fortunate enough to count several of the faculty there among my mentors and friends, including um, Mark and Manish and then Swapnil. Um, I'm going to I see we, you. Uh, just one thing, I think we've lost your slides. We, we see you, so we see your screen. Can you see my, my slides now? No, we just see you. Okay, well, that's, that's good. Uh, give me two seconds. Yeah, no problem. Sometimes you just stop presenting and resume. It'll allow you to choose which. Uh, there we go. Now we got your slides. OK, excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much. It is an honor. And uh, hopefully I'll get to visit Osha in person someday as it looks very pretty. And uh, obviously there's a fantastic faculty oh. I'm familiar, very familiar with. Uh, so I'm going to discuss today um, the impact of chronic kidney disease on stroke risk mechanisms, management and outcomes, and this forms the basis of my PhD that I've recently finished at Oxford. Um, I, on the basis of this, I was invited to uh, take part in a Kediaga Controversies conference um, where I worked with Manish, and we shared the session there on cerebrovascular disease and uh, produced a consensus document from that with some with some guidance and a review of what evidence is existing. And, and also uh, we set a research agenda based on what evidence is, is not there. Uh, but anyway, I'll get started. Um, chronic kidney disease, as you all know, affects 10 to 15% of the populations worldwide, uh, with about 2 million patients requiring dialysis. Uh, it's a rapidly rising global health burden, mainly because it's an established risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Um, but despite this, uh, patients with CKD are often underrepresented in cardiovascular disease trials, leading to important knowledge gaps in this area. Um, for example, it's been shown that CKD patients have been excluded from over one third of major stroke trials, and only 3% of studies have reported baseline kidney function, which is rather alarming. Uh, there's strong associations between CKD and cerebrovascular disease. Uh, stroke incidence in CKD is about 13.4 per 1,000 person years, and this rises to 25.3 per 1,000 person years in dialysis-dependent patients with stronger associations between hemodialysis compared to peritoneal dialysis. Uh, the incidence does fall post-kidney transplant to at 6 per 1,000 patient years, but this still remains much higher than the baseline. Uh, population stroke incidence rate. Uh, in a previous meta-analysis of uh, 83 studies with over 2 million participants, it was shown that the stroke risk increased 7% for every 10 mL per minute decrease in GF4 and increased 10% uh, for every 25 mg per mL increase in albumin creatinine ratio. Uh, stroke risk increased linearly and additively with declining GF4 and increase in albuminuria. And the uh, Risk associations appear to be particularly strong for the proteinuria group. Um, in this other meta-analysis, even after multivariate adjustment, it was shown that there, there was a 71% increased relative risk of stroke in the presence of proteinuria. Um, 
which is uh, pretty impressive. Uh, there are important temporal relationships between the timing of dialysis and stroke risk with uh, the period around initial dialysis initiation representing a particularly vulnerable high risk time period for this group. Uh, in a cohort analysis of over 20,000 incidence dialysis patients, it was shown that the incidence stroke risk increased uh, four to seven fold during the months surrounding hemodialysis initiation. Um, and although it fell subsequently, um, it, it only really stabilized at still kind of twice the baseline rate and um, kind of showing that uh, the sort of consistent um, excess risk in this group, um, but particularly in that month kind of before and after um, dialysis initiation. Uh, stroke subtypes uh, are very important because they actually give us a lot of insight into mechanisms, prognosis, uh, treatments and, and, uh, and risk of recurrence and, and thus they are uh, sort of an essential kind of data point for, um, for stroke care. Um, however, not that much is, is known about stroke subtyping in CKD and, and how it changes according to the stage or according to dialysis dependency. Uh, so we, we did an analysis of um, stroke subtyping using the Oxford Vascular Study, which is a population-based study in Oxfordshire. Um, we included over 3,000 patients and uh, categorised um, stroke subtypes according to the TOAST criteria. It's probably the most widely used stroke classification criteria. And just to kind of explain the abbreviations here, CE is cardioembolic, unknown, large artery disease, multiple pathologies, undetermined, that's where you've investigated, but you still don't know what the cause of the stroke is, small vessel disease or lacunar, and then other defined pathology. And so what you can see from the graphs here is, although there appeared to be major differences in CKD prevalence um, between different TIA and stroke subtypes, um, CKD prevalence also strongly associates with age. Um, so when the median age of each TIA stroke subtype was plotted against the odds ratio of individual TIA stroke subtypes, you can see there's a linear relationship suggesting potential confounding by age. And consistent with this hypothesis, uh, the prevalence of CKD showed a similar pattern of variation according to age within individual TIA and stroke subtypes, just sort of emphasizing the importance of sort of age-specific subtyping in kind of future studies of, uh, of CKD. And um, importantly, though CKD is associated with worse stroke outcomes, uh, based on the FICO Stroke Registry study, which is um, a very large multi-center cross-sectional study, and um, nearly 4,000 patients with first ever ischemic stroke, they found that after adjusting for potential confounding factors, including initial stroke severity, that there was a 49% greater risk of neurological deterioration, a 138% greater risk of impossible mortality, 25% greater risk of significant disability at discharge, and 73% uh, greater risk of recurrence of non cardioembolic stroke. Uh, just to show you some unpublished un data from the Oxford Vascular Study, um, we indeed also found there was um, a high risk of stroke recurrence in patients with CKD, um, even after multivariate adjustment. Um, however, this risk of recurrence was, was mainly present and strongest for, for the kind of first 90 days after stroke and sort of kind of dissipated back to kind of baseline rates compared to the general population after that. So um, I, th I think that's going to be something that will be important when we're trying to decide what to do with uh, potential kidney transplant recipients who have a stroke and, you know, when it's safe to kind of relist them, et cetera, and the timing around that. So what is known about stroke pathophysiology and CKD? Well, it's thought that there is that there are synergistic uh, traditional and non-traditional risk factors at play. Obviously, there's very high prevalence of hypertension, atrial fibrillation, and diabetes in this population. But non-traditional risk factors are also postulated to play a role, such as genetic susceptibility, uremia, oxidative stress, vascular calcification. And then there are also risk factors intrinsic to dialysis, particularly hemodialysis, including cerebral hypoperfusion, blood pressure variability, left ventricular hypertrophy, um, vascular calcification, et cetera. Uh, we updated an earlier meta-analysis that examined the association between CKD and stroke risk and uh, kind of categorized studies according to the way in which they adjusted for hypertension. Um, we decided that not adjusting for 
hypertension or blood pressure is obviously the worst form of adjustment, followed by only adjusting for kind of one blood pressure measurement or a few blood pressure readings, uh, followed by adjusting for sort of a composite uh, definition of hypertension with sort of the better forms of adjustment being adjusting for you know, an existing diagnosis of hypertension or ideally adjusting for multiple blood pressure readings over time. And, and really what we found is that when you adjust robustly for blood pressure, i.e. kind of adjusting for multiple readings over time, maybe the best kind of marker of long-term control, that you know, much of the association between chronic kidney disease and stroke was, was, it was attenuated, kind of emphasising the importance of hypertension as a confounder in this relationship, at least in um, pre-dialysis CKD. Uh, we repeated the study then just looking at patients with proteinuria and categorising studies according to the way in which they adjusted for blood pressure. Um, but what we found really is that um, even with sort of robust blood pressure adjustment, um, there remained quite a strong and independent association between CKD and stroke risk. Uh, as I've said, there are unique risk factors in the hemodialysis setting. Um, for example, in a study of 58 hemodialysis patients, it's been shown that every 10 millimetre of mercury decrease in mean arterial pressure was associated with a 3% increased risk in ischemic events. And uh, the cerebral mean arterial flow velocity has been shown to, uh, to decrease in dialysis, leading to transient uh, intradialytic hemodynamic instability. And this has been associated with cumulative white matter changes over time um, that may be somewhat miti mitigated by using cools diosolate. What about risk prediction tools in patients with, uh, with atrial fibrillations and CKD specifically? Um, as we know, there are tools in the general population, well-known tools including CHADS2 and chads VASC score that can, are used to quantify risk in the general population. Um, and, and, and essentially, you know, these scores have been kind of modified to include renal parameters over time to see if this would improve their model discrimination in this group. Um, but really all scores, even sort of the renal modified scores, have demonstrated poor model discrimination for their ability to predict ischemic stroke in patients with CKD and atrial fibrillation. And there's probably a number of reasons for this. Um, firstly, um, these scores tend to use binary variables, CKD versus no CKD, which kind of fails to take into account the fact that stroke risk you know, increases with declining GF4, in the, even in the presence of atrial fibrillation. Um, furthermore, risk factors are dynamics. So patients who may have had normal renal function can develop renal dysfunction or can develop worsening renal dysfunction. Um, and in addition, you know, CHADS, VASC, CHADS already contain a lot of risk factors that are strong, already strongly associated with CKD or, or comorbid with CKD, like hypertension and heart failure. Um, so it's, it's just debatable what is the use of, of these tools in an already, an already higher risk population. And um, similarly, it's been shown that sort of these risk prediction tools seem to kind of worsen with uh, with declining GF4 and have very little predictive ability in dialysis patients. Um, unfortunately, bleeding scores are also uh, inaccurate in dialysis. Sorry, sort of going rogue. Uh, are also a little bit inaccurate in dialysis and bleeding has been hemorrhages and atrial orbits. And um, I know this is something Manisha is particularly interested in in developing sort of renal or dialysis specific scores to help sort of risk stratify in this complex group that are unfortunately at both high um, stroke risk but also high bleeding risk. Um, there are also unique diagnostic challenges in this group. Um, the theoretical risk of contrast induced nephropathy with, with uh, CTA or CT perfusion imaging. Obviously we're all well aware of, kind of the more recent conflicting evidence of this. Um, but it's probably a risk that's sort of somewhat overstated in the past, but it can lead to delay in some time-sensitive treatment pathways if you know approval, if there needs to be approval for, for the and um, for the contrast from nephrology, etc. Um, in addition, uh, gadolinium-based contrast agents used for MRI are obviously rarely associated with a debilitating, a debilitating skin condition, necrogenic systemic fibrosis, but Again, it's been shown sort of that there is quite a low risk with sort of the newer stable um, group two contrast agents. And in addition, stroke protocol sequences for MRI don't necessarily require uh, don't necessarily require contrast. You, you really only need your diffusion weighted imaging and, and flare and T2. Uh, 
in addition, in dialysis, um, it has been shown that there is a greater than threefold increased risk of stroke death. So that can lead to some um, challenges in the ascertainment of the cause of the specific stroke. Um, it's also been shown that patients are kind of are actually more likely to present with the stroke um, during the dialysis session or shortly after the dialysis session. And sometimes that can lead to sort of under recognition of the event. Maybe it could be attributable to kind of intradilatic hypertension or sort of other kind of peridialysis phenomena. And um, it's been shown that these patients can present uh, kind of much later than their general population counterparts at a median at 8.5 hours, which is kind of more than twice the median time for the general population, despite their kind of frequent interaction with healthcare providers. And uh, there are some other inequalities in, in stroke care for these patients. Um, this was a nice analysis from the Get with the Guidelines Stroke Program cohort in the US, nearly 700,000 ischemic stroke patients. And they showed basically that despite higher inpatient mortality rate, um, each strata of CKD was less likely to receive evidence-based therapies compared to normal renal function. And they found they were less likely to get to be thrombolyzed, less likely to get antiplatelets or DVT prophylaxis, less likely to get anticoagulation, less likely to get stop in therapy, and even less likely to receive advice like smoking cessation. Um, this study was sort of, um, this is kind of consistent with kind of more recent Scottish renal and stroke registry data as well. Um, in this nice study from Paddy Mark, he showed that um, for dialysis patients in Scotland, they were you know, less likely to be admitted to the acute stroke unit and they were less likely to receive aspirin acutely. Um, and uh, this was in the context of them, unfortunately, being much more likely to die from their stroke. Um, both, you know, seven days, 28 days, and one year after the events. And the importance of the stroke unit in stroke care can't really be overstated. Um, in the general population, uh, it's been associated with 28% reduction in death or dependency. The number needed to, to benefit is only six patients, you know, as compared to actually eight for thrombolysis. Uh, and, and even in the ESKD population, it has been shown that admission to a stroke unit is associated with a lower risk of death. So it's actually kind of a relatively easy intervention that is effective in this group. Um, obviously, lots of challenges regarding kind of the other acute therapies in stroke, specifically thrombolysis and thrombectomy. Um, IV thrombolysis is obviously now the standard of care for patients presenting within specific time windows in the general population and um, according to imaging findings, um, you know, it's been shown to improve functional outcomes and survival. Um, unfortunately, kind of most patients with CKD, particularly advanced CKD, have been excluded from kind of major TPA trials. Um, so the evidence guiding their use in this group is kind of largely based on sort of observational studies. And um, for example, there was this meta-analysis of seven studies in 2015, and this showed that they do unfortunately have a higher symptomatic um, intracerebral hemorrhage risk rate, and that they do unfortunately have higher mortality risk and increased risk of poor functional outcomes. However, um, there's a lot of heterogeneity in this meta-analysis and uh, you know, um, lack of data on sort of timing or dose of TPA and the uh, and, and most importantly, no comparator arm that included patients with CKD who didn't receive thrombolysis. Um, interestingly, in this post hoc analysis of the Enchanted trial, you know, one of the few studies, few trial studies that you know, has reported some CKD subgroup specific data, um, and, and they showed an association between CKD and increased mortality, but not disability or ICH risk. Um, and interestingly, uh, you know, this excess mortality was. Uh, you know, attributable to pneumonia, sepsis, non-vascular etiologies, you know, kind of maybe highlighting the um, opportunity to um, kind of improve stroke care for these patients in the acute period by sort of adjunctive therapies or but kind of um, optimizing the stroke care pathways. There was a more recent meta-analysis published just last year looking at thrombolysis in, in CKD. This included 20 studies or 60,000 patients, but again, and 19 of the 20 studies were observational. Um, and this, unfortunately, this did show that moderate to severe CKD was associated with increased risk of ICH and worse functional outcomes. 
Um, however, I, I think that the um, associ risk association was kind of was, you know significantly lower in the um, in the adjusted analysis, and you know it's unlikely that the large benefits of an acute treatment in the general population would be completely nullified in um, in this group, and it would be expected that their outcomes, particularly in the context of a severe stroke with a high NHS, NIHSS score, the large vessel occlusion would be better in the absence of treatment. Uh, similarly, for thrombectomy, these patients largely excluded from these trials, um, and this is a very efficacious tre treatment in the general population, number needed to treat for reduced disability only 2.6. Um, again, observation studies suggest higher risk of mortality. Um, this was a uh, prospective study of 500 patients with anterior circulation stroke. Um, there was a high risk of hemorrhage in this kind of smaller study of posterior circulation stroke. But again, the benefit of posterior circulation thrombectomy even in the general population is um, somewhat unclear. And CKD did seem to be a significant predictor of worse functional outcomes in, mort in mortality um, in thrombectomy treated patients. But Again, important limitations in the studies, kind of use, you know, all observational um, and no comparator arm of patients with CKD who didn't get these treatments where you would expect the outcomes to be, you know, even worse. Um, what about dialysis prescribing um, in patients with acute stroke or other acute brain injury? Um, this is uh, you know, somewhat an evidence free area um, theoretically increases in brain water content, but intermittent hemodialysis can cause further increases in intracranial pressure and can worsen um, the acute stroke um, by extending the penumbra, or by causing stroke extension. You know, subclinical cerebral edema has been shown even in stable dialysis patients. There's also the potential for osmolality fluctuations due to um, reverse osmotic shift from ure urea or other brain osmols. And this can also have the potential to increase ICP um, as we've shown previously, there are blood pressure volume fluctuations in stroke. Um, global cerebral blood flow is reduced by 10% um, by in dialysis. And then anticoagulation could potentiate hemorrhage or worsen um, cerebral edema and increase the risk for herniation syndrome. Uh, so um, there isn't really great evidence to guide this area. We did produce some consensus suggestions from the Kidago Controversies Conference, which have been published in Stroke. Um, I think obviously that you know your dialysis prescription studying should be individualized, you know, including the modality, timing, dose, anticoagulation, etc. And you know, should always involve consultation with the nephrologist and stroke physician, ICU, etc. And um, some general suggestions that we thought theoretically could be helpful um, would be obviously using continuous forms of therapy preferentially if patients at high risk of raised ICP, those would be patients with, uh, you know, with you know, large vessel strokes or with blood pressure dependent infarcts from like an intracranial or extracranial stenosis um, or intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, consider delaying dialysis if possible if there's a particularly high risk of raised ICP or herniation. Um, an important point we thought of was like timing dialysis so that they didn't impede essential rehabilitation services. You know, when we speak about the importance of acute stroke unit that's kind of largely attributable to you know the kind of specific rehabilitation therapies that um, like come with it. Um, using pooled dialysis could be helpful based on sort of the kind of chronic ischemic studies that we've that we've seen recently. Um, obviously you need to make careful decisions around anticoagulation, avoid using dial dialysers with large surface areas, use slow blood flows, gentle fluid removal, considering shortening the dialysis session. And obviously, in PD patients, try to minimize hypertonic large volume glucose exchanges. Um, but definitely, uh, you know, high quality observational randomized evidence is, is needed really to kind of make, any, to give any definitive guidelines in this area. And um, we also produced uh, sort of consensus recommendations for primary and secondary prevention of stroke and CKD, sort of based on the kind of current therapies that are used in um, the general population we sort of examined what was the CKD or dialysis specific evidence in each of these groups. Uh, so starting with antiplatelet therapy, uh, patients with moderate to severe CKD have been excluded from most um, clinical trials evaluating efficacy and safety of antiplatelet therapy. 
sorry, you can see a common theme emerging. Um, but in a meta-analysis of three, three trials, uh, antiplatelet therapy for primary prevention of stroke in patients with CPD did appear to increase the risk of major bleeding events without reducing major cardiovascular events or mortality. Um, and, uh, you know, this would be consistent from like the three big trials that we've seen recently about use of aspirin for primary prevention in you know, the general population. So Aspire, Esprit, and I can't think of the last one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for secondary prevention, however, studies kind of do show a benefit in terms of reducing the risk of MI, not specifically stroke as an endpoint, but, you know, at the same time, most guidelines uh, would recommend antiplatelet therapy for the secondary prevention of stroke in CKD, um, particularly as there are quite large, well-established benefits for its use in secondary prevention in the general population. Um, the, interestingly, the ATTACK trial is one to watch out for. I think that's going to be complete in 2025. So this is based in Southampton. It's an open-label multi-center primary prevention trial of aspirin and CKD, which may clarify the role or lack thereof of aspirin in this setting. And uh, in terms of anticoagulation therapy, this is obviously a controversial area, particularly in dialysis patients. Um, in CKD, there is emerging evidence, though, that uh, non vitamin K antagonists, oral anticoagulants appear to be superior to warfarin in CKD. This is one example of a meta-analysis of 11 trials where it was shown that there was a lower risk of stroke, systemic embolism, hemorrhagic stroke, and all-cause death. Um, however, the caveat here of this meta-analysis mainly includes the patients with a crowning fear and greater than 25 mils per minute. Um, however, there's no difference in the risk of extracranial bleeding. Uh, in terms of warfarin, the role of DOAX, I guess, is a little bit more uncertain. Um, warfarin itself is also sort of a debatable benefit in dialysis patients. Um, in some meta-analysis, such as the one here, it has not been associated with a significantly lower risk of ischemic stroke. Um, but again, this is based on meta-analysis of only observational studies. There's never been a trial in this area. Um, I think there is one ongoing at the moment of k which will compare um, vitamin K antagonists to, to no anticoagulation, specifically in dialysis groups. That would be interesting to see the results of that. Um, at the k Controversies Conference, we kind of spoke a little bit about kind of what progress had been made since the earlier arrhythmia conference, or what was the you know, latest evidence in this area. Um, probably the importance of time to therapeutic range has been maybe underestimated in trials or studies of warfarin in this group. And so it has been shown that you know, patients with a TTR less than 70% do have a higher risk of stroke and thromboembolism. So I think it's important to include this monitoring you know, in, in studies or trials where you are comparing warfarin to your vitamin K antagonists, non-vitamin K antagonists, anticoagulants. Um, we also discussed the Cree well, study during this, uh, this conference. Um, this is a multi-center trial that compared vitamin K antagonists to um, rivaroxaban. And the third arm included is rivaroxaban and vitamin K2 supplementation. Um, this was based on the hypothesis that functional vitamin K deficiency may contribute to vascular calcification progression. And to assess this, they measured various calcium scores and pulse rate velocity, but ultimately kind of found kind of no big difference in terms of faster classification progression and no difference in terms of the clinical outcomes, which were you know, all cause mortality in cardiovascular events and stroke. Um, however, there is emerging kind of observational data to support sort of preferential use of, of DOAX compared to the K antagonists in the dialysis patients. This was a retrospective cohort from URDS, DSRDS that compared warfarin to Pixaban in over 25,000 patients with ESKD and atrial fibrillations, and there was no difference in terms of stroke or systemic embolism, but it picks man appeared to be associated with a lower risk of bleeding. And um, sensitivity analysis suggested that the standard dose of Pixaban was superior to the reduced dose um, or warfarin. Um, in terms of kind of more recent trials, renal AF unfortunately was terminated early with just 154 patients in one year follow-up due to lack of funding. This showed similar rates of bleeding and stroke. However, the TTR for warfarin was only 44%. Um, importantly, though, the pharmacokinetic sub-study kind of does suggest that uh, 
you know, steady state of pixaban exposure is modestly higher, but broadly similar in dialysis patients, even using the five milligram EID dose, unless patients were over the age of 80 or less than 60 kilogram weight. Um, the Volkwe study subsequently published sort of a in a post hoc kind of cohort analysis where they followed patients up for kind of further 18 months to, to compare, um, I think, safety and efficacy outcomes of three arms, you know, vitamin K antagonists, rivoxamine, rivoxamine, and vitamin K2. Um, and they did, uh, they did suggest in the study that there was a reduced positive fatal and non fatal cardiac events and bleeding outcomes compared to vitamin K um, antagonists in the dialysis population. And then two further studies are ongoing in safety and exadia. However, these are small and not likely to recruit the number of patients needed to, um, to kind of demonstrate definitively kind of safety and efficacy of uh, DOAX in this group. Um, okay, and then in terms of left atrial appendage occlusion devices, seem to have similar procedural safety um, in patients uh, with relative absolute contraindications to anticoagulation. Um, but uh, overall, still patients with di on dialysis with lower survival in the same frequency of um, major adverse events at follow up. Dual blockade may have a role based on the COMPASS trial. Um, this was a trial that was deliberately en enriched for patients with CKD, included over 6,000 patients. Um, and, and this did kind of demonstrate that low dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin um, reduced the primary composite cardiovascular outcome as well as stroke as an individual endpoint. And there was no excess bleeding reported in the CKD group. However, importantly, they excluded patients less than, an EG4 less than um, 15 and only included 150 patients with a GFR between 15 to 29. And um, so the generalizability in advanced CKD probably isn't there. And even though there was no excess bleeding, because the baseline rate is higher, the absolute rate in CKD will still be higher. But I'm um, still a very interesting area to watch. I think the track trial is ongoing at the moment, and um, that might might help um, kind of further um, delineate the role of dual blockage in CKD patients. Uh, there's well established evidence for lipid lower therapy from the SHARP trial, and um, there's a 25% reduction in ischemic stroke in patients treated with simvastatin azitamide combination. Um, unfortunately, kind of from the subsequent meta-analysis, the efficacy of statins, however, does appear to wean with um, advancing kidney failure and little benefit in dialysis patients. Um, still, overall, very good evidence for statin therapy, both in primary and secondary prevention of stroke, at least in pre-dialysis of KD. In terms of hypertensive therapy, latest guidelines suggest we should be targeting a blood pressure that's 120 over 80 millimeters of mercury in both primary and secondary prevention settings in CKD and um, where it's safe to do so and where it can be tolerated and um, it's largely driven by subgroup analysis from SPRINT. There's also some evidence from the China Stroke Primary Prevention Trial that showed that there was a 49% reduced first stroke risk with time average systolic blood pressure of less than 135 compared with um, SVP 135 to 140. And um, so, you know, kind of really good evidence that um, that uh, antihypertensive therapy and statin therapy um, are important in both primary and secondary prevention for stroke. SGLT2 inhibitors, interestingly, may have a role. This is just kind of very recent data published this year in a meta analysis of uh, four SGLT2 inhibitor trials, although they didn't find a benefit in the general population for stroke, fatal stroke, ischemic stroke, or undetermined stroke. Um, there was a beneficial effect on hemorrhagic stroke. And actually, there was a beneficial effect for total stroke in um, the population of patients with EG4 less than 45 mils per minute. Um, mechanisms for this is a bit unclear, um, but it's uh, certainly an interesting finding, another um, fetter for the bow that we can add to um, SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, carotid interventions, there was only kind of one, one big trial really that kind of reported outcomes according to CKD status, and this was kind of the NASAD study. And in this, there was a statistically significant relative risk reduction of about 80%, with numbers needed to treat being only four in patients with CKD. You know, overall, patients with CKD who have carotid interventions have a reasonable survival at five years, much better than that of their peripheral vascular disease counterparts. However, survival is only about 40% in dialysis patients after intervention, and the, therefore the kind of safety and efficacy in dialysis populations for carotid interventions is less clear. You should really probably only consider it for kind of high-risk symptomatic patients. In summary, um, 
treatment and prevention of stroke in this group. Um, it's probably some inequalities in, care, in care. Obviously, there's a lot of granularity in that data that's kind of you know difficult to report about overall kind of frailty, morbidity, goals of care, etc. But you know certainly um, there do seem to be differences in kind of access or decisions to give certain acute treatments. Stroking it is an easy, highly beneficial therapy in this group. Uh, usual preventive treatments are effective in CKD, maybe sometimes less clear in ESKD. Slight blood pressure control is likely helpful. And DOICs may have a role, at least in kind of mild to moderate CKD and patients with polyvascular disease. Uh, so we don't know maybe if there are ways in which we can improve the safety and efficacy of hyperacute treatments in this group. Um, it's certainly an important area for study, as is how to best prescribe dialysis in this case setting. Obviously, the holy grail of, of stroke prevention in CKD is to um, you know, better, uh, better define sort of the, the best uh, anticoagulant, if any, to use in dialysis patients. And then it would be interesting to see whether kind of to a pathway blockade could have a role in more advanced CKD or ESKD. We just don't really know that yet. And then similarly, you know, as we do more cross intervention trials, stenting versus endarterectomy, you know, could they have differential roles in more advanced CKD as well? And it's just the last couple of slides. As I said, you know, this is a group with higher risk of in hospital deterioration and greater disability, mortality, less likely to be discharged home. But also there are kind of more longer term downstream consequences such as cognitive impairment. This was the regard study which showed that every 10 mL per minute decrease in GF4 was associated with 11% increase in the prevalence of cognitive dysfunction. And this is thought to be attributable both to kind of asymptomatic silence through vascular disease as well as symptomatic events. Um, all markers of small vessel disease are increased in CKD and dialysis patients including white matter hyperintensities, lacoons, microbeads, etc. Um, over half of patients with CKD or on dialysis have silent cerebral infarcts. And these are powerful predictors of cerebrovascular as well as all, as well as of all types of vascular events in the future. It's not really clear how to manage these patients, you know, with silent cerebral infarcts. There isn't really any evidence to guide us or to guide these findings even in the general population. Probably doing some simple things would be helpful, like putting patients in statins or controlling their blood pressure. If the imaging findings suggest embolic stroke, searching for atrial fibrillation or uh, endocarditis or carotid disease would be helpful. But again, an area for future research. Okay, uh, so just to finish on this slide, um, you know, this is a really interesting area, lots of scope for more research to um, better define subtypes in CKD, uh, to identify better bleeding risk prediction tools, to better delineate the role of non traditional risk factors. To determine how best to treat patients with silent cerebrovascular disease, to determine how better to improve acute or hyperacute treatments, how to prescribe dialysis and acute brain injury, what is the best anticoagulant, what is the role of dual blockade in advanced CKD, are there cross interventions that would be helpful in dialysis patients, and what are the predictors of cognitive decline in this group, and how can we prevent it? So thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kelly, for this fantastic talk. Uh, a gr great topic, great presentation. Um, I, I guess just tying into your last slides as I was uh, uh, thinking and, and, and leave a, a lot of time for questions, but maybe I'll start. Um, so you went through uh, many of the interventions that you know have shown uh, a lot of effectiveness to the general population. And part of it is renalism, where you know a lot of our CKD and advanced CKD patients are excluded from these trials. but. But in the few trials that we have, um, the traditional interventions like anticoagulation, statin, don't seem to work. And, and your last slide presented a bunch of, of research opportunities. But as, as it tends to be challenging to do research in nephrology, you know, if you had to pick an area where the community or, or, the, or the, the, the renal community could get behind and really push on, on what you think is a really worthwhile one or two areas where you think there may be some uh, true benefits for our patients. Um, would you be able to kind of have a, a couple that you could pick? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I think I think for me, number one is um, you know a, a big trial. I think the most important thing we should do like a really big trial of, of DOACs in um, in dialysis patients. 
And I guess ideally to have three arms, you know, DOAC, warfarin, no anticoagulation. You know, even if you look at kind of the ongoing trials, they're all very small. They're, they're not going to answer the questions um, that we have about, you know, ICH risk or extracranial bleeding risk. Um, certainly, like all the observational data is promise, promising and, uh, you know, the pharmacokinetic data is also kind of reassuring. But, you know, you really need a big trial to answer this question. And, you know, whenever I tell people that I've done my PhD on the subject, this is like, the same question I get again and again, you know, what, what do you give dialysis patients with atrial fibrillation? So uh, that would be like the number one area, I think, for me. Um, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to pick another area. I think we're probably trying to figure out what, what the role of kind of prevention of treatments in those with silent cerebrovascular disease could be useful because I, I think we end up scanning our patient, patients or doing a lot of brain imaging in this group because they have falls or delirium etc and we, we get these findings quite a bit and I think we you know I don't we don't really know whether it would be helpful to give these patients aspirin you know so I think that would be another important area of study. Fantastic. Anyone else? Swap. I, uh, thanks again, dear Bluff, for that wonderful uh, presentation. It seems uh, bleak, of course, but um, you know how do you? Uh, it's uh, often what we cop out by saying is that you know, okay, the benefits are perhaps there in some people, but the risks are also higher with any intervention, right? Anticoagulation or what have you, is that we say, okay, you should individualize it, and you know, you should do shared decision making. Uh, you know, what is more important for the patient? It always seems to me like a cop out. Uh, like, you know, OK, you know, hand waving. Uh, is there is there anyone doing actual research to, you know, uh, pinpoint these things on shared decision making tools or, or, you know, because patient priorities are important, right? Someone may weigh stroke differently than a GI bleed. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, um, yeah, and it's a really question. I think they, there has been some research looking at kind of some of the uh, kind of bleeding risk versus anticoagulation decisions of patients in terms of um, where they have looked at uh, kind of patient reported outcomes in those studies and kind of shown that actually patients um, patients do care quite a bit about like their bleeding risk. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, having better risk predictions tools in this group would be very useful, but also probably kind of, you know, counseling, individualized counseling in that group would be helpful. Um, but but I, th I think it's likely that, you know, a lot of simple things may help mitigate the risk to, you know, co-prescribing PPI, you know, that's sort of emerging in the general population. Like for, in Oxfask, um, you know, we would give everyone over the age of 75 um, a PPI with their uh, with their anti blood therapy routinely because it because they had kind of shown in a kind of big Lancet paper a couple of years ago that it was like this age group that had the kind of highest incidence of GI beads, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but yeah, I, I think maybe changing our thinking around this would be important to you. I mean, as you guys alluded to, renalism, maybe our, kind of our first approach to prescribing or to kind of seeing a patient with acute stroke should be, OK, I'm going to give them this treatment, you know, I, like, you know, I'm, instead of like looking for reasons not to give it, um, you know, trying to find all the reasons to give it. Um, because certainly that's the, the frame shift that's happened in the general population when someone comes in with a stroke now compared to when I was like a you know, more junior doctor that now it's like give me a good reason not to thrombolize this person give me a good reason not to refer them for a thrombectomy and I think we kind of don't quite have that same mentality or maybe ED docs or whoever is that sees these patients at the door don't quite have the same mentality when someone comes in with their dialysis line etc um, for, for good reason obviously you know, you've seen the the risks, etc. But it's hard to know what was the right thing to do. Uh, uh, Brendan. Uh, thanks. I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. Um, my uh, main clinical interest is peritoneal dialysis, and uh, I have to ask you uh, about a uh, comment you made earlier on in the talk, and, and I certainly know there is observational literature suggesting a lower uh, risk of stroke in peritoneal dialysis patients. My, my question for you is, do you really do you think that's anything more than residual confounding? Because, of course, that is the, the biggest challenge comparing uh, hemodialysis and PD populations. And and if not, if and, and certainly it, 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 it's physiologically quite uh, 
compatible that 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 the the issue has to do with the intermittent um, cerebral hypoperfusion on hemo. Uh, how would you study that? How because we, you know we're always looking for reasons uh, to tell people to go on home dialysis, and uh, as as you know, people do fear strokes, and and uh, especially if you're in the context of secondary prevention. Uh, how, how would we get better quality data to convince people, or to convince me anyway, that I should tell people to to go on PD because they'll have a lower risk of stroke? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there there is some data, observational data, as you say, to kind of suggest that there is lower risk of stroke or lower risk of cognitive impairment in this group. But uh, obviously, there is the oh, inherent, there's always the inherent selection biases in these studies in terms of kind of patient selection. Um, that by, with PD patients, you know, you are often selecting out patients who um, might be less multimorbid and might already have uh, kind of greater cognitive reserve at, at baseline. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it is like a difficult group to study. Um, I suppose like, you know, just kind of quite robust adjustment for these potential confounders at baseline in terms of, um, you know, prior cerebrovascular disease or kind of baseline maybe imaging findings, looking at kind of the cerebrovascular disease burden at baseline. Um, you know, looking at the kind of cognitive scores and educational status at baseline um, is probably your best way to kind of, you know, tease apart some or kind of rule out sort of the residual confounding factors that you kind of alluded to. But yeah, just, maybe just looking at, at secondary prevention, you, if you take patients who've already had a stroke, they're arguably more similar and looking for those that have previously had a stroke and then go to PD versus hemo. And, and then that, that may cut down on a lot of this residual confounding if, if you have a more homogeneous group. Yeah, exactly. That would be, that would be a great study. That would be ideal because, I mean, I think if you have, um, you know, a PD population where, you know, where both arms have had a uh, have had prior stroke, then you know theoretically they should have a similar risk of you know a similar risk of recurrence or a similar risk of kind of subsequent cognitive impairments. Um, yeah, I think that would be a great study. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I'll be the sucker. You said people always ask you, what do you do for your dialysis patients with atrial fibrillation? So what do you do? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think certainly in, you know, in our, in Irish practice kind of, um, we are using uh, DOAX more liberally in the dialysis population, generally at the lower dose though, kind of regardless of age or weight, which is, not necessarily, not really evidence based, um, and I guess anecdotally, so far we haven't really been running into any trouble with it. Um, but it's certainly not kind of widespread practice here yet. Um, but uh, I, you know, I, th I think um, I think I, I think you have to. It's, I would you know we just try to we just do, do consultations about the maybe lack of. Data and the pros and cons of each choice, um, but but I, I I think I would give it to you, a dialysis patient. So, so I guess I guess I've spent you, you know a bunch of years, sort of counseling the patients, but pushing for stopping warfarin and not using anything. Uh, but you're not in that camp. You're in the warfarin versus DOAC rather than nothing. Yeah, I. I think so. I think it depends a little bit on the patient, which is probably a cop of, of an answer. But uh, you know, I think I think it's certainly if it's like an older, frailer patient where um, who has not previously had a cerebrovascular event, who would be higher risk of falls or higher risk of GIB. Then I think certainly a conservative no treatment strategy in someone like that is like you know a good move. But if it's like a younger patient um, who you know has incidental atrial fibrillation, um, then where there aren't, where like the bleeding risk isn't too kind of too excessive, then you know I probably would treat that person with a DOAC. But I think there would be sort of the additional considerations for patients who may be kidney transplant recipients. In in Ireland, for example, we the, the protocol here is not to um, is that you can't really transplant anyone who's on a DOAC. So those patients tend to be treated with warfarin because of the kind of reversal. Um, 
the reverse of the strategies that they have in place here. Um, I guess maybe less widespread use of indexnet alpha or kind of more concerns about the associated thrombotic risk attached to that. So I guess that would also be a consideration when deciding for dialysis patients. Because I guess the practice problem here is uh, mostly it's us seeing people on dialysis some days or weeks after somebody else has made a decision to do something, whether a neurologist or a cardiologist. Um, uh, and pretty well always their decision is to start something. Uh, and here they've been very conservative about DOAC, so it's almost always warfarin. And sometimes they're saying, oh yeah, we know about dialysis <clears throat> patients and warfarin, but this person has a really high CHAD score, so we're going to go ahead. <clears throat> Um, which, uh, you know, is a really high CHAD score, more of a reason to use a anticoagulant versus not. I mean, you presented the crappy discrimination scores. But, um, you know, I'd contend that a lot of those people with a really high CHAD score probably have a really high bleeding score, but we don't have a good way to score it. Um, yeah. I I think it does depend on the individual patients. Uh, you know, I think I think yes, you're right. There's certainly kind of a kind of a reasonable dialysis subpopulation there that would be very challenging to safely anticoagulate, particularly with a dog. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else uh, for one uh, last question? Um, I think Dr. Canny, Mark. Hi, Derva. Hey, Mark. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, well, I just wanted to say hello, because otherwise I won't get a chance because we can't bring you out for dinner or anything. So, um, well, first of all, just to say thank you for the talk and congratulations on an incredible amount of work in the last few years. And I believe you were also awarded a recent uh, new investigator award from the European Society. Is that right? Oh, oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know from the European Stroke Organization. Yeah, probably, probably a bit of a... It's thing. fantastic. Thanks very much. Uh, so Derv and I worked together about 10 years ago. <clears throat> I was going to say a million years ago, but then it's my 10-year wedding anniversary. <laughs> Derv was at her wedding, so I can't say a million years ago. <laughs> that makes me very old. So, um, But uh, uh, she was a, a rising star in the ranks in, in Cork where we worked together. And it's been really great to see uh, your your career so far and uh, delighted that it's going so well for you. Um, I did have one question and it's something that I, I'm looking at in the in the GN space and it's trying to figure out like how we can improve uh, risk prediction tools in these specific cohorts. And one of the issues for sure, I think anyway, is that the CKD population such as it is, is this big sort of mesh of comorbidity, not really knowing what the kidney disease is, um, whether this is age-related decline in GF4, or whether this is, you know, multimorbidity and drug-related things. And um, so one of the things that uh, I'm learning in this process is that understanding the underlying cause of CKD and trying to get good data on continuous measures of proteinuria in particular uh, is very challenging, even in CKD research cohorts. And I think this is a big thing that's holding us back, is that we have good data on those traditional risk factors, which we know do not explain the risk in its totality. But then when we want to add in some kidney-specific factors, we don't have the data because we don't do a good enough job of figuring out why they have kidney disease in the first place. And proteinuria, which is the most important risk factor we think, is generally undercaptured even in research data sets. And I think uh, without having those continuous measures, we're probably not going to move the needle on those uh, C statistics or reclassification or whatever way you want to look at it. So I think uh, in part, this is our own fault. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good comment. I mean, I, I think you can see that, like with the forest thoughts of like the pertinent rate patients, as you say, kind of specifically, and the way that those associations with stroke don't attenuate with adjustment for hypertension. That 
you know, that, I guess that group represents, you know, probably a heterogeneous group of patients with a variety of CKD etiologies, maybe beyond like sort of vascular disease and, uh, you know, it sort of would be kind of interesting to look at the association between kind of specific sort of CKD etiologies and stroke risk or GN and stroke risk because there hasn't really been anything published on that really kind of studies look at kind of all cause CKD um, as you say because of due to kind of lack of information maybe on etiologies maybe um, in the past so that would be like a really interesting area to, to, to study. Um, but um, yeah and thanks very much for your comments Mark too. Mark's probably the main reason that I'm a nephrologist, so uh, you can take the you can take the blame or the praise. <laughs> I think we both have uh, Liam Plant to uh, to blame for our, uh, <laughs> our nephrology careers. Uh, I think Deb had a question, but uh, uh, her hand is down now. Um, well, um, so it's 8.57 uh, Ottawa time, so um, almost uh, 2, I guess, uh, p.m. Dublin time. So uh, thank you again uh, for this great presentation uh, and, and the discussion. This was, uh, this was awesome. Uh, as uh, Marcus said, it's too bad uh, we don't get to uh, have you visit Ottawa and take you out for, for dinner. But uh, on the other hand, you do, uh, you do uh, minimize a, a lot of travel and save a lot of time. So it, it's good and bad. So thanks again, uh, everyone. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Kelly, for the fantastic presentation. Um, and uh, have a great uh, morning, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Great to meet everyone. Thank you. Bye, Dr. Take care.